You do? Oh, okay. You going down?
Clark's first born brother Spencer Anderson will be uh, preaching here tonight at 7 o'clock. And since I have mentioned his name, the young preachers at South Carthage, and I don't know who else, but at least the young preachers over at South Carthage Church is going to be having a tent meeting. And they're going to put the tent out here uh, in the... Uh, on the lot that's owned by Philip and Stephen and Brother Richard. And so um, I'm announcing this. I hope the members of the church won't be uh, upset. They just chose to uh, have a tent meeting and they gave them permission to have it out there on that lot. Uh, choir practice and uh, Bible study will be held here Wednesday night at 6 30. Uh, Brother Chuck will be teaching again uh, this Wednesday night, and we will also be having food this Wednesday night. I'm going to be bringing pizzas, and Miss Elaine is going to draft about a dozen of these women to help her bring some, uh, some uh, desserts. desserts. That's what it is, desserts. Yeah, desserts. So, uh, uh, everybody that can come about six o'clock or a little earlier if you want to, uh, a little later if you want to, and uh, you'll be welcome to eat uh, with us. Uh, congratulations goes to Brother Paul and Miss Frances Hackett. They are great grandparents, great grandparents uh, this week. Uh, Miss Elizabeth had. Uh, a big baby girl weighed eight pounds and how many ounces? Eight pounds and four ounces. Mama and baby are doing fine. Uh, two birthdays this morning, Brother Richard Brooks and Miss Olivia. Olivia Davison. Olivia Davison, that's Brother Roger and Miss Deanna's uh, granddaughter. Any other birthdays? Uh, Jeanette Watts has one. All right. Before we get into the reading lesson, uh, we need to go to the Lord in the word of prayer. Brother Phil, will you lead us this morning, please? Carried on to 
at this time, Heavenly Father, that someone can come in this room and hear thy word, be convicted, and be saved. And Heavenly Father, spend eternity with thee. We pray for all the lost this morning, Heavenly Father. Be with all the little ones in this church. Heavenly Father, may they hear the word from our pastor, Heavenly Father, that will help them find the precious to every dying soul. Be with Heavenly Father, those on the prayer list this morning, those Heavenly Father that may be near death. We pray for them, Heavenly Father. We ask you to be with them, Heavenly Father, and thy will be in their lives. We ask you to be with all the Sunday school teachers this morning, Heavenly Father, and teach the little ones. Be with Brother Gentry to 11 o'clock hour. We ask you to be with men and women on the foreign field this day, Heavenly Father, and guard, guide, and direct them, and bring them home. We ask all these things in that name for thy sake. Amen. Amen. Our reading lesson this morning comes from the book of Revelations. Uh, it's chapter 7, and it's verses 13 through 17. Now, I apologize for the length, but I think it all ties together pretty well. Uh, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve, serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun of light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. That concludes our green lesson. If we'll please stand, we'll have a verse of the song and pass to our classes. We'll do, peace, set, and free. studying, this is probably one of the 
hardest uh, things that I've studied uh, since I've been teaching out here. Uh, however, it is a very simple message, but between the first part and the last part, there is a lot of stuff that uh, I will say that I didn't necessarily uh, understand, and I had to go back, and last night I read a uh, thing on the internet that took me about 45 minutes to read about a, it was, it's a basically a timeline of, of what we're going to talk about today, but uh, our, our lesson passages is Daniel 9, 20 through 27 and 12 through 9, 13, the biblical truth, although the power of evil and tribulations exists for a time, God will use tribulation to refine his people and ultimately raise them to their destiny of eternal life. And the life goal to help you be prepared for increasing tribulation you may face as a Christian. Well, the very first thing I thought I would do is tribulation. What is tribulation? Uh, the dictionary uh, gave us the definition, a cause of great trouble or suffering. Great trouble or suffering. Now, um, I don't know how you are today, but if, if you go day to day in this world, you have all kinds of things that come up and stumbling blocks or roadblocks and, and we have tribulation and suffering every day. It, uh, Matthew 24, 20, 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, not ever shall be. And Job 14, 1 says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So one thing I think we all can agree on this morning, that no matter who we are, where we are, what we're doing, whatever it is, that we all have trouble. Uh, I took Thursday morning off to... Uh, actually just have, I, I call it a mental health day, because in, during football season, sometimes I go, 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 and it, it, it overruns me. So I took Thursday off to have a mental health day. I got up and took Ella Kate to school. I went back home. I brought Sabra breakfast. I went and took the trash off. I was gonna do all the things that I had to do that way this weekend, I wouldn't be as slammed. Well, I went and got a haircut. When I got out of getting a haircut, my truck wouldn't start. Well, I called Sabra and her and Agnes were taking a nap. I called Daddy and uh, he was not really woken up from his nightly nap yet. And uh, so I decided that it would be much easier. He said, I'll come get you. I said, no, by the time you get here, I'll be almost home. So I was in South Carthage, so I just hit the rails for trails and took off walking. And I made it to within 200 yards of my house before Sabra's mother picked me up. She was coming to, to, to see, uh, see the baby. However, it was very hot and I wasn't prepared and I had on flip flops. And right now on my left foot, I have a big blister about that big. And I, uh, just to say, um, different things come our way. We have trouble. Guaranteed. Now, our lesson today uh, is, is straightforward, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever read or heard the prediction of the second coming of Christ? Everybody in here will agree with that. If you've read it, you, it's in the Bible, we read, read about it, we hear about it. We've heard people predict it. We have said, you know, I'll just go back to one. So when, when they turned the millennium, 1999, December 31st, when we clicked over to January 1, 2000, the world was going to end. Okay? The world was going to end. There's been several, several times. Predictors of the second coming of Christ have long existed. To date, all of those who have predicted the time when Jesus will return have been wrong. Wise believers recall the words of Jesus who said that no one other than God himself knows the time of Christ's return. Now, we know that it's coming. If we would believe the Bible to be true, we know it's coming. We know the end time is coming. And everybody has their opinion. I can ask you a question about different things and we'll get all kinds of different opinions. 
and I could probably start right here and go all the way around and you all have a different opinion about when the second coming is happening. It's going to happen. Uh, nobody knows. We can only speculate. The only one who knows is God himself. It says, ever since Jesus ascended to the Father, Christians will await his return. When the Bible, while the Bible does not reveal the date for his return, the Bible does reveal numerous events that will precede Jesus' second coming. Until Christ does return, believers should be prepared for difficult times. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is Daniel's prayer and, and vision and what is prophesized to him by the angel Gabriel. Now, it, it gets pretty uh, different things, and I probably will do a terrible job of explaining it, and a lot of it I'm just going to skip over because, it, it, as it says, there's, there's a lot of dialogue about this, and I, I will tell you I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Uh, but this and Revelations is, is, is what they say are the two, two of the hardest things to do. But we'll get to our verses, Daniel 9, 20 through 23. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people of Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening of Galatia. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. And thou, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. It says, Daniel's vision in chapter 9 is indicated to have come during the first year of Darius. While in exile, Daniel read that the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that the Israelites would be in exile for 70 years and then the Lord would restore his people. I want to make a point right here. What, what was Daniel doing? He was studying. He read that the prophet Jeremiah, he was studying the scriptures. I want that to be the one of our first example. This is a, a man, and it's, we're going to go down, and he says, um, that uh, thou art greatly beloved. He was highly thought of. Highly thought of. His personal relationship with the Lord was on a high level. And it shows him being the example of sitting there reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Daniel realized that Jeremiah's prophecy near fulfillment and the prophesy, prophecy called for a spirit of repentance from the Israelites. Sending the end of the captivity and beginning of the new era, Daniel prayed for further understanding, laying his petition before the Lord. Uh, Wednesday night, I am going to teach on prayer. And during the service, uh, the, the worship service at 11 o'clock, I'm going to give homework to everybody. So if you stick around, I'm going to give you homework for Wednesday night if you're coming back. Because this week is going to be Bible study. You're going to have to study some instead of me doing all the study. So uh, we will get to that. But what did Daniel do? He studied the scriptures and then he prayed. In verses 20 and 21, in his prayer, Daniel confessed his sin and the sin of his people. The acknowledgement of sin is part of living in right relationship with God. Daniel's prayer was regard to a holy was in regard to the holy mountain of God, a reference to Jerusalem. So he's praying for his sins, the sin of his people, and, and, and praying about Jerusalem. He said, before Daniel finished praying, the Lord sent Gabriel to give the prophet an explanation. So he got in touch. His prayer, and it's at the first part of this chapter, and uh, if you're ever wanting to, to read a good prayer or study something, Daniel chapter 9, the first verse is his prayer, is something that I suggest to you. But Gabriel is going to come to him. And he, we read that Gabriel appeared about the time of the evening sacrifice, which would have been approximately 4 p.m. Though the Israelites were not offering sacrifices in Babylon, they did keep those times for prayer. In verses 22 and 23, Gabriel indicated that he came to give Daniel understanding. This must have, this must have been a relief to Daniel. Gabriel informed Daniel that he was greatly loved by God and the answer would be given to Daniel in order for him to understand the vision. 
So Daniel, being captive here, stood, was studying and praying. And the Lord's going to send the, the angel Gabriel to give him understanding about what he was praying about. So in my opinion, and this is Chuck's opinion, that Daniel must have been in pretty good touch with the Lord for him to come and send him this angel like Gabriel to give him this vision. Daniel 9 through 12, 9, 12, 9 through 12 records the prophet's final visions of tribulation and the eternal reign of God. Daniel understood that God's people would face increasing trials leading to the end of time. Daniel helps Christians understand the reality that trials for believers will come as the end of time nears. I want to point this out. Nobody in here knows when the time is going to stop, when Jesus is going to come back. But we know we're getting closer. Every day we get closer. And uh, it says Christians are going to face trials and tribulations. I'm going to dare say that this morning we're in the minority. I don't know if you realize this or if you thought about this, but how many people, let's just take Smith County. How many people in Smith County this morning are not in church? How many people this morning that are Christians, <coughs> proclaimed Christians, decided I've got something better to do or something else to do? Okay? You, you watch the news tonight, and I guarantee you, that there will be, you will see things that Christians are in trouble for, you know. And 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 I'll I'll just put this out there, you know. I try not to watch the news because I don't I don't like to watch bad things, hear bad things. But I'm a sports guy, so I watch a lot of ESPN now, a lot of SEC Network, a lot of NFL Network. You know what the number one thing I've read about all week is whether or not Michael Sam was going to make the team based on his preference of, of being a homosexual. And that for the last, since April, has been shoved down our throats, which is completely against you know, what we believe. And so, you know, times are bad. If you're a Christian, you're in the minority. And uh, guaranteed that it's going to get rougher and rougher and rougher and rougher. It said, God considered Daniel to be very precious, to be a very precious treasure in all situations, but perhaps especially in times of tribulation. Christians can pray to Jesus for further understanding and assistance. Jesus will respond to our prayer because Jesus considers all of his children to be very precious treasures. Not, not only did God send Gabriel to comfort Daniel because he was a treasure, in Matthew 20, uh, John 10, 27 and 28, he said, My shepherd, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The good news is that if we are his children, and you can answer that one for yourself, but if you're his children, no matter what comes about, God will hold you in the palm of his hand and nothing can take you away from him. And no matter what the trials and tribulations are, if we're his sheep, we're in the palm of his hand. We can always pray to God for further understanding, especially when we are suffering tribulation because of faith. We suffer tribulations. How much tribulations are because of our faith? Or are we one that blows in the wind and just, just lets, it, lets it go? Prepare for difficult times, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. No, now, excuse me, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in tre troublous time. And, the, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for him. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. 
and unto the end of the, of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make, the, make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that is a, a mouthful. It says, verse 24, these four verses constitute some of the most challenging prophetic words, not only in the book of Daniel, but in the entire Bible. While believers may find particulars elusive, Daniel communicates them clearly. So this is Daniel communicating what Gabriel communicated to him. It says, this passage records Daniel's prophecy of the coming Messiah to bring in everlasting righteousness, a time when sin and the penalty of sin would come to an end. So Daniel is being shown by the, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel that Jesus was coming, and Jesus was going to be the one to put an end to all sin, and Jesus would pay the ultimate sacrifice, would be the ultimate sacrifice and pay the ultimate price for our sins. He would give his own life for us, and that in the end he would come again to bring the end to it all. Daniel also prophesies at the end of an age that evil ruler will emerge and persecute God's people, but his wicked activity will not exist forever. The prophesied Messiah will come again and judge the Antichrist. In verse 25, when will the, when will the return of the Messiah occur? Gabriel told Daniel to know and understand the prophecy. The mention of 70 periods in seven weeks equals a total of 490 years. Okay, now I'm not going to get into the timeline of all of this, but uh, if you go and study, it, th this timeline goes all the way up until Jesus' uh, crucifixion and death on the cross. And this 490 years, and it goes uh, B.C. and A.D., and you have to, there was a thing that converted the 360 days of the former calendar to the 365 days of the new calendar and you lose so many years and all that stuff and it was very interesting but very hard to get along but just to say this this just goes from before Jesus to the birth of Jesus to Jesus his life and ministry and to his crucifixion death and resurrection however as with prophetic language there these are not necessarily continuous time periods there is debate about whether these are literal or symbolic years with different views pr proposing different starting and ending points. The primary theme of these verses, regardless of the point of view, is that God's people will face times of severe trial, but God will ultimately destroy the Antichrist. Daniel prophesied that from the time of the issuing of the decree to, the, to reveal Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah will be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. The Lord did not reveal to Daniel the exact time of his second coming. What was certain was that the rebuilding of Jerusalem would come at a time of great difficulty, such, such as the difficulties Nehemiah experienced during the rebuilding phase. Believers can take comfort in the fact that the Messiah, the Prince, would come and that he will return. His victorious return is the focus, not the date. And though difficult times will come, his return and victory are guaranteed. And so, with all that being said, the, the two things that I can point to you that I am 100% sure about is that Jesus came once like he said he would. He died and he rose again and he's coming again. And in, in our life, we have, we have a choice. We have a choice and it's heaven or hell. And we can, we can seek to find Jesus or we can seek to run away from him. But in the end, there's going to be difficult times for all of us. You know, I, we may pass on before the second coming. We may pass on before the times get really hard for Christians. Nobody knows. But there are going to be difficult times. You face them daily, I face them daily. There's difficult things that challenge what we stand for, what we believe in every day. Every day. And it's getting more and more and more and more and more. However, no matter what the challenges we face as Christians, if you're on God's side, if you have Jesus in your heart, 
one day after a while, someday, I can't tell you the day, I can't tell you, you know, I can't tell you that, but one day after a while, he, he's coming back and victory is guaranteed, period. In verse 26, much within this set of verses points to Jesus' second coming. The statements in this verse relate to the Messiah being cut off, refer to the crucifixion of Jesus. Daniel foresaw the tribulation and death that Christ would suffer in providing redemption for his people. Having nothing of his own, the Messiah was buried in a borrowed tomb. The second event mentioned in the verse can relate to the destruction and the end of the rebuilt temple around A.D. 700. With the flood of Roman armies sweeping over the nation as a result of the revolt, the desolation would be the destruction and would come as a result of war that ensued during the destruction of the temple in Israel itself. The deeper meaning of this phrase relating to the historical event also may refer to a future uh, cataclysmic event that will take place at the return of the Messiah. And, uh, you know, we, you, we've always thought about and, and talked about there's songs and there's verses that talk about the second coming of Christ. And if you read Revelation, all the things that's going to happen when he comes back. Uh, you know, the, the moon turning to blood and, and, and different different things. But can you imagine the picture? You know, they're talking about a catastrophic event of the war when the Romans took over Jerusalem. And in the thing I read, it described a, it described a scene where there were dead bodies everywhere. People were starving and that, that mothers were eating their children to survive. Uh, I don't know how you are, how you women are, but dare to say, I believe you, most, most of you ladies would let your children survive before you. Uh, but you can imagine how bad the times are if, if, if women are eating their children to survive, how, how catastrophic that is and how bad it'll be. And then when, when Jesus comes back, the, the events that before he comes back that may take place, what, what a bad shape our world's going to be in. In verse 27, Daniel prophesied that the coming of the Messiah will take place in difficult times. The reference to he in this verse seems to be the Antichrist. He will enter a covenant with God's people, but will then turn on them, even putting an end to worship, as indicated by the reference of sacrifice and other aspects of worship. But in the end, wrath of the Messiah will be poured out on the desolator, the Antichrist. God revealed through Daniel's prophecy that Christians should expect difficult times and increased tribulation at the end, as the end time approaches. The Lord also reveals that we can rest in the certainty that he will destroy the enemy, the Antichrist. Believers can trust the Lord and live obediently for whenever we face difficult times. And I just said, I, we could go around and we could talk about the difficult times that we all have. We could sit here and have a pity party because we know we all have them, we all have different things. But in the end, we should trust in the Lord and try to live obediently for God. Now, to step up over here and read this out of the book to say trust in the Lord and be obedient to God is very, very easy said. To do that on a day-to-day -day basis is a struggle. Is a struggle. But we have to be like Daniel and be in the scriptures and be prayed up and be close to God. That way when those difficult times come, that when we're down in the valley, that we can step, draw close to God and that he will pull us through. Y'all know how frustrating it is when you're trying to call somebody and you really need to talk to them and you can't get in touch with them. You call them, you leave them a voicemail, you text message them, whatever it is, and you can't get in touch with them. Think about it. Think about your difficult times. If you're so far away from God, it feels like you can't get in touch with him. So it is our job and our our, our duty as Christians to be studied up, prayed up, and close enough to God that then the difficult times that we're close to. Persist in living for God, Daniel 12, 9 through 13. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the work, for the words are closed up and sealed to the end of time. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination made that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. 
Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the, th the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou, go thou thy way to the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of thy days. In beginning in chapter 10, Daniel received a final vision which concluded in chapter 12. The closing verses of chapter 12 can be applied to the entire book of Daniel. God encouraged the prophet to be faithful to him, to live confidently all of his life because of a promised future. Think about that. That's what he told Daniel to do. So that's what I'm going to convey to you. Be faithful and to live confidently all of our life because of a promised future. That's one thing we can look forward to. I'm sure everybody down here, in the end here, would love to be a millionaire and just have everything you wanted, everything you needed, and just to live a grand old life. However, it's not that way. For some it is, you know, for the most part, but you look at all the people that you know that are making large amounts of money, and I'll go back to sports. A lot of those guys make a lot of money but you see on every day on the news, they have major, major, major problems. Money and stuff's not gonna, not gonna give you what you're looking for. So, stay faithful to God and live confidently that one day after a while, we'll have everything we've ever wanted and everything we ever need in Jesus Christ. Verse nine, the angel encouraged Daniel to go his way and continue to live as he had always lived. Faithfully and obediently. There it is again. Faithfully and obediently. The angel said the words were secret and sealed to the future. These words would not be fully fulfilled until the end time with the return of Jesus. At the end time, believers will be purified, cleansed, and refined. These things, will ha these things also happen as believers endure the times of tribulation now. Also now and at the end of time, the wicked will continue to act wickedly. With the return of our Savior, the wise will understand all of these prophetic messages. The angel revealed two time periods to Daniel, one numbered 1,290 days and the other 1,335 days. Doubtless, the prophet continued in his lack of understanding, and these figures perplex believers today. Again, it is important to understand that the things of these verses, living faithfully and confidently for God, is important. Assuming the age of Daniel to have been around 15 when taken captive, the prophet was well over 80 years old when he received his final vision. The Lord gave the prophet one final word of encouragement, his own resurrection, eternal destiny at the end of the days. While we can, cannot know the exact timing of the end time, we can live faithfully and confidently for God every day because of the sure promise of our resurrection and eternal life in heaven. The promise is based on the believer's personal relationship with God through the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Uh, this morning, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer it out loud, but I just want you to take, between now and when I finish, take the time to think about your personal relationship. Run it back. Make sure everything is okay because there is a second coming. And when Jesus comes back, or if we kick the bucket before then, there's heaven or hell, one way or the other. And if you're on the Lord's side, if you have that salvation in your heart, you are to do a couple of things. And it's at the bottom it says, what now my mission? If you don't have Jesus in your heart, you should stop and seek him before it's everlasting too late. But if you do, it says, pray and request that God provides you with greater understanding during difficult times. Again, prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. I think that's the, one of the most important things after salvation is that we are in constant communication, constant communication with our Lord. Next, trust and obey. All right, trust and obey. It goes back where to faithfully and obediently, faithfully and obediently, trust and obey. We know we're going to have difficult times. We, we, we know that, but we've got to be close to God, and you can persist in living for Jesus because... In the end, everything else in this world doesn't matter except your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and, and what you have lived for, who you've influenced, and, and, and things like that. Uh, again, I, I hope you got something out of this. It was a 
good thing for me to study and, and, and dive into it. It was hard. But one thing I can tell you is that Jesus is coming back. And hopefully we're ready. And if we are ready, hopefully we're living faithfully and obe obediently like he asked us to. Have a good week. And uh, thank you for listening.
But I believe I'm getting a PS4. Because there's a game coming out, uh, Shadow of Mortal. My dad already has a PlayStation 4. Can you get that now for this PlayStation 4? Are you? I picked them up. I picked them up. I'm a big Well, I want to see that. I'm a big belly flop. I probably killed myself. I'm going to be dead. Right,
you haven't noticed yet or noticed in, all our songs are about work since it's Labor Day weekend. Come into a mate, all ye that labor and are, he are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am met and lonely in heart, and ye shall find the rest in heavy souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Page 
Lake Day vacation and visiting ten folks and uh, what have you. But we appreciate all of you being here. Those who are visiting with us, we're glad to have you. We want you to feel at home and welcome in our services on this morning. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, Brother Spencer Anderson uh, will be here uh, preaching to us. We invite you to come and listen to Brother Spencer. He's working hard at it, uh, studying a lot, and uh, we think that he's going to make a good, good preacher. Uh, also, Wednesday night, choir practice at 6.30 and Bible study at seven o'clock. Uh, we will be having food at six o'clock. Uh, Miss Elaine and some of her buddies are preparing uh, cake and and um, and uh, pies and uh, she didn't say homemade ice cream. No, I didn't say about pies either. Oh, sure? <laughs> are you sure? I think she said to me when she called me over the telephone that she'd be making some pies. But anyway, whatever. And so we're going to have some uh, pizzas and, and cake and, and something to drink. And we invite you all to come and be here uh, for the uh, a study. And uh, uh, next, I need to say congratulations to Brother Paul and Miss Francis. Uh, in the birth of a new great grandbaby. And she said, Miss Francis said she weighed eight pounds and four ounces. And uh, so uh, uh, she's just about half grown uh, already. Uh, birthdays Miss Olivia Davison, Miss uh, Elaine's mother, Miss Smith, she would have been having a birthday. Miss uh, they Trey Geisenhofer. Yeah, Trey Geisenhofer and Brother Richard Brooks. Uh, any other birthdays? All right. Anniversaries. Uh, Brother Kenny and Miss Donna England are having an anniversary. Congratulations to them. Uh, three deaths. Miss Odie Mae Green, Mr. Josh Sapp, and Mr. Marvin Searcy. Uh, we pray that the Lord may bless their families as we go through this sad and difficult time. Uh, prayer requests for Miss Lois Hamlet, Miss Juanita Taylor, Miss Esteline Sloan, Mr. Mark Andrews, Miss Anita Searcy, Brother L.B. McDonald, Miss Golda Clay, Miss Christine Woodard, uh, Miss Barbara Robinson, and um, Mr. Easton Gold, is that right? And somebody gave me a request coming in the door, and I didn't write it down. Okay, any other request? All right, before we have a word of, of prayer, uh, Chuck has an announcement about the Wednesday night service. Uh, Wednesday night I'm going to teach for the second time and by request of uh, some of you this Wednesday night is going to be more interactive so I'm not going to do too much studying I'm going to do some but I'm going to leave it to you my topic this week is prayer prayer is mentioned 512 times in the Bible 512 in the chapter of Acts it's 20 times by itself so if you can't find any you can look in Acts. Your homework, Brother Phil told me not to say that word because he didn't do homework. But your, uh, what I would ask you to do is that you get in your Bible sometimes between now and Wednesday night and try to find five verses, five verses dealing with prayer. And five, those five verses, we're going to talk about how to pray, what to pray for, when to pray, and we're going to have a discussion about prayer on Wednesday night. So, uh, again, I beg you guys to do it, to uh, study, because if not, we're going to be standing here looking at each other, because I'm going to say I gave you homework, 
And I'm going to have my five verses, so I hope you have yours. And uh, bring a pencil. I'll provide you the paper, something to write with, and we will have, uh, I guess, a class on prayer. And uh, I'm going to pick on Brother Phil as, uh, as my star student, so I hope he, I hope he studies, studies up. Him and, him and Brother Tom White are going to be my star students. I may set them on the front row. Uh, but uh, if you can, please come Wednesday night. Remember his uh, challenge and be here if you can. We need to go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask his blessings upon our service this morning. We ask you to bow your head uh, as we pray. Go and give you open. Would you leave us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for seeing us through another week. Lord, we thank you for bringing us out this way. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us, Lord. Let us take our minds off the world and set them upon heavenly things. Pray, Lord, to give Brother Gentry the power to preach. Help us, Lord. Help us to open our hearts that we can be understanding. Pray, Lord, that you'll lead God and direct us in this service. These things we pray in thy name. Amen. Amen. Miss <coughs> Katie, you ready? Okay. Like I said, we're in the blue book now. We're going to...
Sunday, and on each fifth Sunday, we take an extra offering for the building fund. So the guys will be passing among you again.
this morning from the second book of Kings. The second book of Kings, chapter 2. Chapter 2. Beginning with verse 8. Verse 8. The Bible said, And Elijah took his mouth and wrapped it together and smoked the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind, and Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the souls of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. We'll close our reading. And this is reading from verse 8 through verse uh, 15 of chapter 2 of the book of 2 Kings for our devotional uh, on this morning. The subject of my uh, message uh, this morning, although the word is not mentioned in this chapter, is passing the torch. Uh, passing the torch. In 17, rather, 19 and 76, uh, there was a torch passed uh, through the community and cities, little towns of South Carthage and South Carthage. We were celebrating the 200th birthday of our country, and the torch was to be representative of the liberty and the freedom can you hear Miss Elizabeth? Just Larry. Turn it, turn it up a little bit, Jesse. Uh, and it was to represent the freedom of uh, religion and the freedom of speech and all the freedoms that we have uh, in this United States of America. I cannot remember the people, but they brought a torch to somebody down at the county line and I passed it to them and they brought it to Carthage over at the end of the Cordell Hill Bridge and another person received it and they carried it on to the Putman County line uh, and they uh, passed it uh, to somebody up there. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about a religious torch uh, that one of us passes to another and on and on as we pass the torch. Uh, people have been passing the torch uh, for a long time. Uh, Abraham uh, is the father of the faithful. He was an Old Testament person and uh, preachers have been preaching about him 
Sunday school teachers have been teaching about him uh, for longer than any of us uh, can remember. Uh, God Almighty uh, called him from the earth of the uh, Chaldees, uh, and he responded uh, by leaving his father's house, by leaving uh, his kindred, and following uh, the Lord. Now, uh, Abraham lived to be old, uh, 860-something years old, but the Bible said, and he died. And in order uh, for the religious uh, principles and practices of that time to go on, somebody uh, had to carry his torch uh, and remain uh, teaching uh, and practicing as he did. The lot fell upon his son. God Almighty uh, intended that to be so from the beginning. He promised Abraham uh, that through his seed, all families of the earth uh, would be blessed. It would have been impossible uh, for Abraham himself uh, to touch all families of all times of the earth. Uh, but through his son Isaac, uh, why, uh, it went on. But Isaac lived and he finished his journey and he died. And when he uh, died, the torch was uh, passed to Jacob. The apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, he said of the Lord, he said, uh, Jacob have I loved, uh, Esau have I hated. Uh, he really uh, didn't hate Esau, uh, but Jacob saw uh, and believed in the Lord and was found of the Lord and became a child of God. Uh, but uh, Esau sold his birthright, uh, like many people are doing uh, in these days and times. Uh, Esau sold his birthright uh, for one mess or morsel of that red pottage meat, and he thought he was going to die if he didn't get something to eat. And probably in these times, people are selling their birthright uh, far less uh, than Esau did in those times. But uh, Jacob wrestled with the Lord, an angel of the Lord, uh, all night. About daybreak, the uh, angel said to him, let me go. And Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And so uh, the Lord said to him uh, that you'll be uh, blessed for the same blessings of Abraham and Isaac, and thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel. He was to be the father of the twelve tribes, uh, and from uh, these came all the uh, Israelite, and later to be called uh, Jews or uh, Jewish uh, people. Uh, not all Israel, that is, not all people who have the uh, national uh, blood and heritage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were uh, saved, but they all had the opportunity uh, to be saved as people do in these times. But having the opportunity, uh, many of them did not pay attention, many of them did not stop, uh, to repent uh, and to believe uh, as the uh, children of Israel, the Bible tells us uh, that many of them perished in the wilderness uh, between the Red Sea uh, and the uh, Jordan River where they passed over into the Promised Land. The reason that they perished in the wilderness was because of their unbelief, the teaching uh, has been the same uh, through all ages of time and will continue to be until the end of the world. Uh, Jacob, Israel, uh, had uh, 12 sons and there came uh, 12 nations of people uh, out of his uh, family. Uh, Judah uh, was uh, chosen uh, to bear the torch of that family, that lineage, 
uh, that had begun in Abraham uh, and through uh, the uh, descendants of Judah, the most precious person that we've ever known, uh, was born the Lord Jesus Christ. He was of the uh, tribe of uh, Judah. One of the uh, great ministers of Bible days was the Apostle Paul. And the Bible said that he was in the tribe of Benjamin. And so uh, what uh, every tribe uh, we are, uh, not, not all the children of Israel were saved, but as many as believed on him uh, were saved. And so it is uh, with Gentile uh, people through their uh, disobedience, transgressions, sins, the gospel came. Uh, to the Gentile people, a people that was uh, nobody uh, by the Jewish people uh, have come to have the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, preached unto them uh, in the time of Elijah. Elijah was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, perhaps the greatest, I'm not sure. There is more mention of him uh, in the New Testament uh, than any of the others. Uh, the Bible said of him uh, that they were asked uh, if they uh, were uh, of Elijah, uh, and Jesus said, Behold, a greater than Elijah is here, uh, meaning that, uh, that uh, uh, Jesus Christ uh, was born. Uh, John the uh, Baptist uh, was a type uh, of Elijah. He was a type in that it, the Bible said of him that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He was not Elijah, but was some like him. Elijah uh, was a man who was unafraid uh, to speak the word of the Lord. He spoke it uh, when it might endanger uh, his life. And so uh, he, he wasn't afraid. He put uh, the gods of Baal uh, to a open test before all the people. Uh, he said to them, let's uh, see who is God today uh, in Israel. And so they built an altar <coughs> and the people uh, of Ahab called unto Baal. Uh, there was no answer from him. Uh, it's the same today when people I pray to the idol gods, the unknown gods. Uh, there is no answer. There will be no answer uh, from the idol gods uh, of this world. But Elijah prayed to the almighty and eternal God, and he answered by fire, and he consumed all the su uh, sacrifice uh, that was laid on the altar. And as they went on, Elisha, the younger man uh, followed him. Uh, and Elijah said to him, said, ask what I shall give thee. I'm going to be taken away. My time uh, is coming to an end. And so I'm going to leave you. But ask what I shall do for thee. And he said that a double portion of thy spirit uh, be granted unto me. Elijah said, thou hast asked a hard thing now. Uh, the torch uh, was about to uh, be passed, uh, but uh, uh, what Elisha asked uh, was a great thing when you ask for a double portion of a man who can pray and the Lord not give rain, and who can pray and he give rain again, who can pray and he'll uh, send the fire down uh, from heaven. Uh, why, uh, he'd asked a hard thing. But he said, if you see me when I'm taken up, he said, it'll be granted uh, unto you. <coughs> and so Elisha, Elijah on his journey, uh, was going along. And Elisha said, behold, the chariot of Israel uh, and the horsemen uh, thereof. And he saw them coming. And in their approach, uh, the Lord took Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind. Now, he didn't go to heaven alive. 
of flesh and blood. I cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, somewhere uh, in his uh, transformation, uh, God changed him uh, to another body, a new body, a glorious body. And as he went up, why, he dropped his mantle down. And Elisha, the younger man, uh, picked up the mantle uh, and he wrapped it together and smote the waters of Jordan and they parted as they had with Elijah. And the Bible said that the prophets viewed from the mountain and they said the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. Uh, so the torch uh, had been passed uh, from the older prophet uh, to uh, the younger prophet. And somebody uh, will ask this morning what uh, is a torch? There are many uh, different uh, uh, descriptions, definitions of a torch. Uh, the first torch uh, was twisted uh, 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 pieces uh, of vines that grows in the field. Uh, uh, simply uh, stems of straw and so on. A uh, fire which lit the torches would soon uh, burn out. Uh, they didn't last long. Uh, the next torch that was to come along was a wood stick. Uh, we know how uh, that wood will burn, but uh, when it has burned uh, and the flame begins to grow dim, while the coals will be red uh, on the end. And so uh, that was the second uh, type of torch. The third uh, kind which we are familiar with uh, is a uh, gasoline uh, torch uh, that people use in these times. Uh, but a uh, more familiar to us, uh, each of us as the children of God are like torches. A torch first is for light uh, and uh, second uh, is to point you uh, the way. Uh, so every day of our lives uh, as a Christian, uh, we are to be uh, torches in that we shine our lights uh, that other people may see uh, there is something in what we profess to be. And not only does it shine the light, but our influence uh, encourages them uh, to follow the light, to follow the Lord, uh, and to be examples uh, in his avenger. Uh, ever since I've been a little boy, I have watched uh, the torch pass from one pastor to another pastor at my church uh, at home when I was a little boy, brother. Uh, Darrell Russell was our pastor, uh, but he soon uh, resigned and moved on. Somebody else came uh, to uh, replace him, uh, and so it has been uh, in uh, all of my life. The torch uh, is passing. Uh, in this church, uh, the torch uh, passes. It began, I guess, with Brother Brooks buying the land and uh, starting the church here. The first pastor uh, was Brother G.A. Uh, Gregory, uh, and then uh, uh, Brother Brooks, uh, and Brother Paul Odom, and Brother Dewey's, and I have uh, come as the fifth pastor of this uh, church, uh, and this is my uh, 46th uh, year, um, but I am done past the 70 or three score and 10 years. I don't know how long uh, that I may get to stay, but one thing is for sure, it's just down the road uh, when the torch uh, is gonna pass uh, to uh, somebody else. We might as well uh, admit that. And in all of our uh, Baptist churches, uh, we have deacons, uh, and usually in every church, uh, we have some good and active deacons, and then we may have uh, some that kind of uh, lags along behind. Uh, in this church, uh, we have uh, some of both uh, kinds. We have some good deacons, uh, and we have uh, some uh, others. Uh, but uh, in every church, 
uh, that is successful, there are some good deacons that helps the pastor uh, in the uh, labor of the gospel uh, and uh, visiting. Brother uh, Overton used to say uh, that the deacons have the responsibility of three tables. Uh, the table of the poor uh, and the table of the widows uh, and the table uh, of the pastors. Of course, uh, there's a lot more work uh, for the uh, deacons to do. They are to be men that are full of wisdom and full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are uh, to be people uh, that the church can look to uh, for guidance uh, and for uh, the uh, Holy Spirit uh, field of services. Uh, that's their uh, duty. They are to be a uh, good moral representatives uh, in the uh, community uh, and in the church. Uh, they're not to be uh, filled with wine, uh, which is excess, the Apostle Paul said, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. I uh, will uh, fill them and help them. But as the torch uh, passes, it passes from one uh, to the other. Uh, in Sunday school teaching, uh, the torch uh, passes. Uh, not everybody uh, is qualified uh, as a, a teacher of the men's Sunday school class. I remember uh, the first teacher here uh, was Brother Ernest Hughes and then Brother Van Robert uh, Gibbs, and then uh, Brother Ernest uh, Sutton. And so all of these men have done gone the way of all the earth. The torch has passed on uh, to uh, somebody else, and it may be you uh, who is carrying the torch uh, this morning, uh, but tomorrow it may be somebody else, some of the young people who are in this church uh, if we want the uh, church to continue uh, in the way that it is, in as good a shape as it's in, uh, the torch must pass uh, to somebody else uh, that they uh, may bear uh, the burden. And so the time comes uh, when the torch must pass. It has been the custom of this church in electing Sunday school uh, superintendents uh, to have a new one uh, every year. Uh, this is the only place where I pastored that we had a new Sunday school teacher, a new Sunday school uh, superintendent every year. But it has worked well. It's given all of the men of this church just about an opportunity uh, to serve and to help uh, carry uh, the torch. And so we continue to pass the torch uh, as time uh, comes uh, and goes uh, as Elijah passed it uh, to Elisha. Elisha picked it up and he didn't miss a beat. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, that Elisha uh, did twice as many miracles as did Elijah. Elijah, that great uh, prophet of the Lord, uh, got despondent. Uh, he got uh, discouraged uh, after he had prayed uh, that the Lord uh, not send rain. And so for three years and six months, he didn't send any rain. The ground got uh, dry, and the Lord told him to go down uh, to the brook. And so he went down to the brook and drank water from the brook, uh, and the Lord sent the ravens, and the ravens uh, brought him uh, food to eat. But after a while, the drought continued and there was no water uh, in the brook. When there was no water in the brook, uh, he commanded him to go down to the widow woman's house. Uh, and he went and he found her uh, at the gate. Uh, she was gathering sticks. But he said to her, uh, he said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm gathering uh, sticks to build a fire. Uh, and prepare the last cake for my son and myself. The uh, flour is about all gone, or the meal is about all gone. And he said, do as thou hast said, but only 
make one for the prophet. I'll first. Now, he was asking a hard thing for her to make a, a cake for him out of the last meal that she had, and there would not be enough left uh, for uh, she and her son. Uh, but he said to her, uh, as the Lord lives, if you do this, the meal will not fail, and the oil uh, will be uh, plentiful. And so uh, she did that. She believed uh, what he said. And as long as the drought remained, there was meal in the barrel, and there was oil uh, in the cruise to cook it in. Uh, so God Almighty uh, took care of the prophet after he had gone uh, to the a widow woman's house. The Bible tells us uh, that he went and stood in the mouth uh, of a cave. And the Lord appeared to him at the mouth of that cave. And he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, he said, uh, I am uh, the last of the prophets. Uh, the uh, false prophets have killed the prophets. I'm the only one left now. He was really feeling sorry uh, for his uh, self. Uh, so sorry for himself that he ran and hid uh, in that cave. And so uh, he said, uh, I'm going to uh, stay here until I die. Uh, the Lord came back uh, in a storm. Uh, the wind uh, was boisterous uh, and the storm uh, was mighty. But he said the Lord was not in the storm. Uh, he sent uh, the lightning and the thundering. But the Lord was not in them. And then a still small voice. And he said, and that was the Lord. And he spoke to him uh, through a, a still a small voice. Now, uh, when the Lord speaks to us, uh, it's not going to be an audible voice. Uh, most likely, it's not going to be uh, face to face as you see me on this morning. Uh, but he'll uh, whisper uh, to our heart or in our ear uh, his will. And we follow uh, the leadership of his uh, spirit. Uh, and he said, the Lord said to him, he said, Elijah, I have reserved 7,000 of the people of Israel that have not bowed their knee to Baal on their uh, kiss uh, his image. Uh, so uh, he was not the only one left uh, as he felt. Uh, sometimes uh, we get down and out. Sometimes we get uh, depressed and so on. Uh, but uh, we need to keep on carrying the torch until we pass it uh, to somebody else. That those who are coming behind us the younger people uh, may see the light and have the right uh, guidance. Uh, in the uh, New Testament, the Apostle Paul uh, was a great uh, torch. Uh, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, in a tremendous and powerful way. He believed with all of his heart that the gospel was the power of God uh, under salvation. And so he just uh, kept on. Uh, but uh, when it come to passing the torch, he said uh, to his son in the ministry, it was not his physical son, uh, but just his son in the ministry, the young uh, preacher uh, Timothy. Uh, he said, Timothy, my son, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I think that it would be uh, wonderful for me to say, to this congregation this morning, to all of you, to be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, by which uh, ye are saved. Uh, if we are uh, strong uh, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we won't be tossed uh, to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But when these uh, new doctrines come, and they do uh, pretty uh, rapidly in these times. When they come, we'll be able uh, to discern them and reject them and go on holding fast 
in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he said, the things that thou hast learned of me, uh, he said, commit thou unto faithful men. He's talking about uh, passing the torch. Uh, Paul uh, was a rooted and grounded and well-established minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wrote at least 13 books uh, of the uh, New uh, Testament. And the Lord was saying to him, commit this, what you know, what you have experienced, commit to, to faithful men, not to just uh, anybody. Uh, some people will not be faithful uh, to the word, and some people will not be faithful uh, to the practice, but commit it to people that you judge uh, to be faithful and strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be able uh, to teach others. Uh, so it's, it's one thing uh, to uh, tell you call a preach, a lot of people have, uh, but you are never a preacher until you go to preaching. Uh, so that, that's what it is. You can tell it many times over, but until you go to preach it uh, and preach uh, regularly while you're not uh, a preacher or a minister, uh, there is uh, more to the full work of the ministry uh, than just saying uh, that you are a, a preacher. Many, many other things uh, in the pastoral work, which I'm not going uh, to go uh, over uh, in my message this morning. But he uh, spoke directly to the young uh, preacher Timothy, and he said, Timothy, I'm passing this responsibility uh, on to you. And so uh, that responsibility has passed and passed uh, time and again to faithful men. It is passed to some who has not been faithful uh, to the work of the ministry, some who have not been faithful to the gospel, some who have not been faithful uh, to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but he said, I'll pass this torch on to them that the work uh, may go on. And so uh, what they passed on was the riches of his mercy, of his goodness, and his uh, grace. Uh, it becomes uh, our duty uh, when we're coming uh, to the end of the journey uh, to pass our torch on uh, here uh, this morning in uh, this uh, congregation. Uh, why there are three of us here. There's some more that are of age, but Miss Elizabeth uh, is uh, past 80 years old. She's well into borrowed time. And uh, Brother uh, Joe uh, is uh, around uh, 80 years old. Be 81. His birthday, I'll soon be 72. So it won't be long for us until we're passing the torch uh, to somebody else. I'm going to spare you, Miss June. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll spare you. But there are others that are just a step behind us uh, this morning. And it becomes our, our responsibility uh, to pass this uh, torch on. The last point of my message is it is a worthy torch to be passed on. Uh, everybody uh, who receives the responsibility uh, ought to feel grateful that they have been counted faithful and worthy to bear the torch. Uh, the, uh, the ministry and the life and the influence. Miss Elizabeth uh, is not a, a minister, she's not a, a deacon, but she has uh, carried the light uh, and the torch of the women folks in this church uh, ever since I've been here. Uh, one lady was a little jealous. She said to me, she said, you treat Miss Elizabeth like she was a queen. And I said, well, she is 
I and she, she wanted to say, but she spared herself, well, I'm a queen, <laughs> you know, but I, I didn't oblige her, and uh, so she didn't stay with us too long. But anyway, we all have the responsibility of carrying uh, our torch and passing it on. I don't know how many people that we can pass it on to. Uh, Brother Chuck, I have lived to see him be a, a grown a man uh, and a man of his own, the father of two uh, children. And I, I guess I have passed uh, some of my responsibility already uh, on to him. And thus far, uh, he has been faithful uh, in bearing the torch uh, that has been a place to him, passed to him when, when he uh, I was just uh, uh, grown and uh, maybe just married a young man. The church was talking to him about being a deacon. And uh, he said, Daddy, I'm too young. And uh, he said, uh, I just don't want to do it. You know what I said? I said, the people of the church are expecting you to step up and take your responsibility. There comes a time when we need to step up and take our responsibility. Some do uh, and, and some uh, don't. Those who don't step up and take their responsibility, uh, it is their loss because there are many rewards and blessings that come with the responsibility of bearing uh, the torch of the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. I appreciate you all listening to me uh, this morning. I hope I haven't uh, been too uh, personal uh, with this uh, message, uh, but uh, sometimes it's important for us to be personal, I think, uh, that people may understand uh, what you uh, are talking about. And so I hope I have been uh, playing with my message this morning and that at least some of us, uh, when we come to that place, uh, will uh, pass our torch. I remember uh, that David said uh, to Solomon, he said, be strong and be a man. Uh, that's, that's all he said, just be strong and be a man. Well, there's a lot uh, in that, isn't it? Uh, Solomon, I guess, reached out further than David did, but you know something? He never reached the height of King David. The Bible speaks more of King David uh, than it does of, of Solomon. Uh, David passed the torch, uh, but it did not shine uh, as bright uh, in the eyes of uh, the Lord or of the people uh, as the torch of David. David was the greatest king of all times uh, for the people uh, of Israel. Uh, Brother Sal, Sister Katie, if you all ready, Miss Katie's standing in the corner. She's ready uh, to go. And uh, so we're going to uh, turn uh, over and let she and Brother Sal shine uh, their torch uh, at this time before the congregation. If you will, please stand and we'll have a verse of, of song this morning. 334. Page 334.
song after my message this morning. While we were singing this song, it, it occurred to me of um, the five uh, uh, pastors that this church has had, three of them are already gone uh, to their reward. And uh, it's, it's with the Lord uh, today, we believe. And so the, the uh, early deacons of the church have gone to be with the Lord. Some of the early uh, ladies, Miss Edith McDuffie, I can't mention everybody, but Miss Edith McDuffie and Miss Gladys uh, Moore and uh, uh, Miss uh, Lady Boston. And uh, so it's like they, they've already gone. Miss Nanny Parkus, I'm told, in the younger years of her life was an outstanding uh, Christian lady here and the most powerful lady uh, in prayer in her younger days. But somebody has to take that torch and, uh, and carry it on. Word from anybody before we go. I remember sitting along about here, and Miss Elizabeth sitting along about here, and I was a young woman with little children. Maybe I would be wrestling with those children until I wondered sometimes, why do I even bother to come? And I remember stepping out one day, and I told Miss Elizabeth, I said, I would give anything if I could just sit here and soak this up like you do. And she said, you will be able to sometime. She knew what I was going through because she raised by a boy. You know, Brother Jim, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like serving the Lord. That's right. My mother taught me the joy of going to church. And I loved it when I was a child, and I love it today. Amen. And I'm not saying, look at me, and I'm just a wonderful person, and I love it. It was taught to me Amen. to love it. And I'm so thankful that it took me. Yes. I'm so thankful that all these years that I've enjoyed it. Amen. Still get to enjoy it, Miss Elizabeth, even more. Even more, girls. As you bring your children, just keep on keeping on. Amen. Don't, don't let it deter you. Don't let it turn you back and say, oh, it's not worth it. I can't get anything out of that today. Just keep bringing them. Yeah. It works. That's right. That's right. Your mother was so faithful. Yes. And she came as long as she could get one foot yes. in front of her. Yes. And loved it. She did. There's joy in serving the Lord. Don't make a Amen. basis just I have to advance. Right. Amen. Teacher, it, it should be a discipline. I'm sorry, I'm saying you know, it. It should it's be a discipline that you go to church. Amen. But it is also a huge joy. Amen. And Amen. Amen. And the joy of it increases our strength. Yes, it's overall. As a Christian. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Elaine. Work from someone else.
dessert, and you'll have some uh, pizza and uh, some uh, dessert on Wednesday night before we sing and study the Bible together. Word from anybody else? First, I don't know what that table. <laughs> what kind you want to make? What you want. I like I like chocolate time. I like time. Well, don't have to. Be. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> but anyway, when I was pastor at Canyon Fort, uh, I had some members that lived at all good. They asked us up for Sunday dinner after church, and the lady asked Miss Puddin what kind of pie she liked, and she told her chocolate. And so, now this part I didn't witness. The men ate at the first table, the women the second table, and she noticed that Miss Puddin was going slow on eating her chocolate pie. Well, Miss Puddin had found something in her pie. And now she didn't know what it, what it was, and, and she really thought that it was a pie that had got in it. And so she just couldn't hardly make it, but the lady said, uh, I bet you're not used to people putting nuts uh, in their chocolate pie. <laughs> and so uh, she was uh, all right uh, when, uh, when she found out what was in it. But I'll say, I'll say this on behalf of people, this is my fifth church, and we eat everywhere, and all of it has been good, 100%. The people have been clean, and they cook well, and had good food, and thank the Lord for every last one of them. I really appreciate that, and I thank you all. This church has been nice to us, and we really appreciate that. Or from anybody else. All right. Those who are seated, please stand. We'll ask you to bow your head while we have the benediction this morning. Just uh, dismiss us.